All right, uh, my name's Ryan Bounce. I'm a teacher here at Jakarta Intercultural School, uh, a math teacher here. Uh, one of the greatest jobs in the world. I love being a teacher. Uh, and what I, I want to bring to you guys is I kind of have a unique starting spot, unique career, uh, and that's what I wanted to bring to you guys. There's an old cliche, teachers say it all the time, that I learn more from my, or learned more from my students than they learn from me. It's an old cliche because it's true. I'm going to go a step further. Not only did I learn more from my students, but I've become the person I am today because of my students. Uh, my unique start, I'm putting this down. Uh, my unique start started uh, at a correctional facility in Colorado. Uh, I started my career in jail, basically. Uh, five years, I worked in a youth correctional facility, a place called Ridgeview Academy. It had boys only from ages 14 to 21, all multiple felons. They were all court appointed, they all had to stay there. They had dorms, they lived there. Okay? They couldn't leave. Uh, so that's where I started. And my original job there was a guard. I was a guard for two years. I wasn't even a teacher. The last three years is when I started teaching at that school, and I've moved on to here at that point. Um, to give you a perspective, because a lot of people don't know what it's like, Ridgeview Academy was ran like a boot camp. Six o'clock in the morning, every morning, one of us, us guards, would come up and yell, everyone on their line, got two minutes on your line. All the kids would have to come out. They had two minutes to get on their line for roll call. We had to see if anyone ran away at the night or anything like that. Uh, then they had five minutes to brush their teeth, comb their hair, get dressed for breakfast. This was all without talking. Okay? It was like a boot camp. That's how we ran this. Okay? A lot of discipline, and that's kind of the emphasis on that. Uh, after breakfast, we'd get them back down, kind of get everything situated, and take them up to the school, which was just up the hill. Uh, from 8 o'clock till 3 o'clock uh, in the afternoon, they were regular students. They just stayed in the school, they went to classes, um, and then at 3 o'clock they came back down. Uh, at 3 o'clock, and I, I love this, this is one of the biggest changing spots in my life, we had basically a, kind of a group therapy session. We had counselors that came into these groups of about 20 kids, and we would talk about what got them there, what struggles do they have, what issues do they have. Uh, and I mean, it really opened up. I mean, to be honest, you couldn't start teaching any better way because you got all these stories ahead of time. Then after we'd had those group meetings, we would take them to a vocational area, which was all on this campus. They learned to do automotive, uh, framing, welding, all these different things. So they had skills when they left. So for two years, I worked as a guard. I was in charge of the down, uh, the down area. Uh, in fact, at one point, I was, uh, I was kind of put in a, a place called Concerns. What this is, is the jail within the jail. So if any of the kids are acting up violent, anything like that, I was the one that was called in. And my job was to take them out and separate them from the rest of it to, to avoid any kind of harm or fights or anything like that. Could be the most stressful job, in fact, it was. By far the most stressful job I've ever had in my life. I could never do it again. I'm too old now for any of that. Uh, but it taught me a lot. Uh, I have a few stories about just the kids, because my big thing is I'm telling you about the kids and what's changed my life and my perspectives. Um, it, I have a few stories that I want to go through, uh, and I do want to change the names just to make sure. Uh, and if you feel bored at any time during the speech, keep track of the names. There's a pattern behind all that, so you can ignore the rest of it. So, first one, we'll talk Bruce. This was within the first month or so when I was working at Ridgeview. Uh, Bruce was this short, simple kid, came from the country, super nice, loved this kid, always talked to you, sir, ma'am, whoever he was talking to, very polite, loved hanging around with the staff, uh, was very open about that, would just follow you around if you got the chance and just loved to talk to you. But the rest of the inmates knew how to get under Bruce's skin. They poke at him, they keep poking and poking and poking. Now Bruce is probably about this, this tall, but about my wife about my size. So Bruce would all of a sudden flip out, black out, and just in anger and rage. And we'd get called in, and they'd call staff from all, we all knew this kid. When he flipped out, everyone was called in. And to put it in perspective, I was below average size at this place. They purposely got big people in there. We would come in, 
he would start throwing people around, and uh, that was our job. We got in one side, wait for someone to get thrown off, and we'd jump back in on that, and he'd just wear, throw us off like a dog, wait, get back on, and basically we just wore him out. That's what would happen every single time. We're all sweating, he's sweating, finally he just stops. As soon as he stopped, it was like a switch. He'd come back out. He'd come out, and he'd be apologizing to us while we're, we're escorting, and we'd be saying, hey, it's all right, it's okay, but he'd be crying, just crying, and, and tears up, and, and I mean, he was so apologetic, and for weeks afterwards, he'd be apologizing. Well, first of all, this is starting to mess with me, because this happens two or three times. Two or three times, so I decided, okay, let me go talk to the counselor. That's one thing that was a benefit of working there versus uh, at school. We get to go know what the story is in the background. So I go talk to the counselor, and I start hearing about what his past is, how he was abused by his dad all through his childhood, how he was actually removed from his family because it got so bad and put into foster homes, and he just bounced around from foster home to foster home. That's my first experience of just... Reality was kind of shaky. Follow that up. I, I keep working. We still have those stressful situations. And the next big one that's just popped in my head when I was going to write this speech was Tony. Tony was this smart aleck kid. He was always talking. He was actually funny in the right context, but Tony always went too far. Tony, though, would once in a while just flip out too. Same kind of thing. Pick fights, get people going, and I was called in again. This was one of the most... I'll even say scarring situations in my life. Because I'd be called in. I'd grab him. I'd pull him out of the area. I'd start walking. He'd struggle a little bit, but usually just let me take him wherever I was going to take him and just kind of move him away to the side. And then we usually just sat him down. Now, the funny thing is, Tony would start screaming at the top of his lungs. Uncontrollable scream and emotion that just came out of him. This freaked me out because I'm not doing anything. I'm holding him here, and he's screaming like I'm ripping his arms off. I have no idea what's going on. Find out afterwards, same thing. I'm, I'm learning now to check faster. Like, what's going on with this kid's past? What's going on on this one? Same kind of story, except this one added to it that his stepdad was sexually abusing him throughout his childhood. Still had it, and that was the funny thing, is if he gets out of prison, that's the home he goes back to, too. He wasn't even in the foster home, and that starts making you think. So this is what starts me off towards education, was this experience uh, in the beginning. Emotion, realizing, like, these kids coming in, you can't take them at, at, at face value. There's a lot going on, a lot of deep things, issues going on. And it starts making me think about this kind of stuff. I moved into teaching there, because, to be honest, I emotionally couldn't take that job, that part of the job anymore. So I went into teaching. I still got to uh, talk with the kids, still communicate with them, dealt with them regularly, but now I get to be a teacher, and to be honest, I get to go home at a certain time, which was nice, instead of staying there the whole time. Um, and this is one of the ones that changed my beliefs. Now, let me give you the context. At no point, kids, am I saying, go deal drugs. That is not the point of the story. Okay, let me point that out ahead of time. I started talking to this kid, 14-year-old kids, uh, kid. Oldest sibling has three younger brothers and sisters. We're talking about the issues, what got him there. He was a drug dealer. Okay, uh, we're saying, oh, you know, all the things that are bad about it. You know, how the the shelf life. You got two years before you're going to be in here at some time, and then once you're in here, you're a repeat offender. These are all the statistics that go on with drug dealers, and they all know that was the thing. He would come up and say, I know dealing drugs is bad. I know that it's a shelf life. I know once I get a record, I'm not going to be able to get jobs. I'm not going to have a career. All this stuff is falling away from me. But then he asked me a question. This one shake, shook me. He says, I have a mom, and she works as hard as she can. But she's not educated, so she doesn't bring in a lot of money. If I go to school, then my, my brothers and sisters, they don't eat. That's really what happens. They said, we have enough money to eat every couple days. That's all my mom can bring in. If I go to school, nothing. That wasn't even context. So his options were this. He could work at McDonald's because that's all he could get a job at. Or he could deal drugs. He says, if I work at McDonald's, I'll get a paycheck every two weeks. That means within those two weeks, my brothers and sisters won't eat three, four times. If I deal drugs, I can get cash that day and I can feed my, my brothers and sisters. It's one of those things that they just ask me, what would you do in that situation? I mean, how do you answer that? 
we all grow up, you know, dealing drugs is wrong, that's it. That's all you say, but you, I mean, what are you going to do if your brothers and sisters, they're, they're in this situation, it's up to you. So, once again, mind blown, don't know what's going on anymore. I mean, these are, there's situations I have no idea about. All of this stuff has happened. I, I worked five years at Ridgeview. I have tons of stories like that. There's great stories there too, and I don't want to make sure make it seem like it was all negative. I had kids that were the first graduates out of their their family to graduate high school. I had kids that went right out of our our school and went into welding and made great careers for themselves. Uh, I got a phone call a year while I was still working at, at Ridgeview. I got a phone call uh, a year later where a kid just wanted to brag that he he got a 95% on his midterm. That was it. Just called, told me that, said, see ya. That was the last I heard of him, but that was awesome. Moved on from there, I went into a, a, a richer area in, in the Colorado area, went to public schools. Within, I don't know, might have been six months or something like that, I had this girl come up, and let me let kind of set the time frame on this one. Uh, during this time, uh, the U.S. was really hitting the recession. Stocks were falling, property was falling through the, roof, uh, through the bottom. Everyone was going broke because of this whole thing. Anyway, this girl comes up, talks to me, and says that the situation she ends up with is every time she goes home from school, she goes home to an empty house. Four bedroom house, no furniture. No furniture, no TV, no couch, no nothing. Okay? They had a refrigerator with some bread in it, that was it. That's all they had. Her whole family had lost everything in the stock market, but because they wanted to keep the image and keep the same spot, she went home to an empty house all the time. She doesn't even know how to re react to that. She doesn't know what to do. Do I stop work? Do I stop school? Do I go get a job? What do I do through this whole? I don't have an answer. I'm a math teacher. I'll show you the quadratic formula. Okay? I didn't have that answer. Okay? And stories like that kept on popping up. You deal with divorce, all this different stuff, families falling apart, all these disputes. I'm starting to realize that, yeah, maybe I worked in Ridgeview, and maybe I worked at a correctional facility, but these stories kept going. No matter where I was, kids kept bringing these in. Finally, I mean, I decided to give my hand at, uh, try my hand at teaching internationally. Started at Beijing, Western Academy of Beijing. Amazed. Still stories coming up. Now, context changes, but stories still come up. How competitive it is. How much pressure the parents are putting. How much pressure they put on themselves. I had a girl talk to me about, she got a 2300 out of 2400 on the SATs. Amazing. Not for, yeah, you know. Okay? Not for her. She said she got berated for three hours by her dad. Her dad saying stuff like, why'd you even try? Why'd you even do this? This is just a waste of time. You're not going to get in the college that we want, we want you to. It was just, I mean, horrible. And that's how her perspective, that's what was going on. I had uh, tons of kids, and I don't know, you guys probably know some of these ones too. Their parents are never around. They basically live in their own house with no parents, no mom, no dad, because they're traveling all over for business a lot of times. But they end up having to raise themselves for the last couple of years. I start hearing these stories, and it's amazing that every place I've gone, I, that's what I've realized. And to kind of shorten this up and try to, I, it's a lot of different stories on this one. What I've learned is this, every kid that's ever come through that door, every kid that I've taught brings their own stories, brings their own person into it. And the person I am today, the character, the, all of the different ideas I have, have been formed by these. I'm, I am who I am today because of the students I've taught. Thank you for your time.